I think we can start. Welcome everyone um, to the final session of the full uh, main part of the workshop. We'll be hearing the remaining three speakers in the plenary session, and then we'll move on to the community session um, on partnerships for future of geophysics panel. I'll turn it over to the chairs. Yeah, thanks, Beth. So uh, good afternoon and, and welcome uh, or welcome back to the plenary session uh, 3B of the Sage Gage Community Science Workshop. Uh, this uh, session is, is focused on new approaches to processing big geophysical and geospatial data sets. My name is Greg Barroza from Stanford University and together with Margaret Darrow from the University of Alaska, uh, we'll, well, the two of us will be acting as chair of the first part of this session. Um, we heard this morning two uh, really outstanding talks from Michael Bianco on dictionary-based tomographic imaging with nodal data and from Lindsay Hay on community open science efforts in geophysical modeling and um, data analysis. This afternoon, we'll hear from three uh, additional speakers on other aspects of how geophysics can continue to uh, thrive in the in sort of the big data landscape that we find ourselves in. Um, and I encourage the audience to enter questions during the, the talks into the, the chat, uh, through the meeting chat. And I encourage speakers to respond during their talks, which are pre-recorded to those questions. And there'll be something like five minutes for Q&A at the end of each talk. So after these three technical talks, uh, we will uh, uh, turn it over to a, another group that will be leading a, a panel discussion uh, on these same topics. So with that, let me turn things over to Margaret uh, to introduce the first of this afternoon's speakers. Thanks, Greg. And thank you, everybody, for joining us at this last um, panel. Uh, today, uh, your first speaker is Michael Olson, who is a professor at Oregon State University. And his talk is entitled Shake, Rock, and Roll, Analyzing and Forecasting Post-Earthquake Rockfall Activity from Point Clouds. So we get to listen to Mike. Hello, my name is Mike Olson. I'm a professor of geomatics at Oregon State University. And today I'm going to talk about how we can use point cloud data to analyze and forecast post-earthquake rockfall activity. I'd like to recognize numerous colleagues that have worked with me on this research over the years. We can develop a quantitative data-driven method to prioritize rockfall mitigation strategies. And so in particular, we're going to jump down to Christchurch, New Zealand, and look at several slopes that were experienced significant rockfall from the Canterbury earthquake sequence that were scanned very frequently with, uh, by GNS Science with terrestrial laser scanning. Then we're going to take those data and develop a predictive model to uh, generate seismic predictions to determine um, what level of rockfall activity we would expect as a result of the seismic activity. And then we'll go and apply this at several different locations throughout the state of Oregon, so five rockfall sites there. And then we'll look at how this methodology can be used to compare different scenario earthquakes uh, using some sites from some highways in Alaska. So let's start talking about the Canterbury earthquake sequence that happened in New Zealand. So the Canterbury earthquake sequence was uh, several different earthquakes that happened in um, the Canterbury area of New Zealand between 2010 and um, 2016. Now there were um, several that happened in areas closer to Christchurch, uh, but it initiated uh, the Darfield earthquake a ways out. Um, but then once the earthquakes hit closer to home in Christchurch, a lot of rockfall was generated. Now, most people, when they think of the Canterbury, New Zealand earthquake sequence, they tend to think liquefaction because there was a massive amount of liquefaction that occurred and uh, caused a lot of destruction throughout Christchurch. Um, but rockfall activity was also significant in this earthquake and there were numerous homes lost. As an example of that in the upper left, we can see Wakefield Avenue where these homes were damaged as a result of the rockfalls from the earthquakes that came down and um, ultimately removed to create a safe uh, buffer zone. And then the image on the bottom is uh, Peacock's Gallop or Shagrock Reserve. And this is a narrow pinch point uh, where the highway that travels between the, the community of Sumner and the greater Christchurch area, um, this is their main access point for transportation and getting uh, goods and, and supplies into the community. And so on the map on the right, you can see in red are the areas that uh, GNS Science focused on for doing terrestrial laser scanning. And and um, collecting a lot of uh, detailed information as far as the, the rock slope activity. 
And then sites in black that you see are smaller rockfall sites that were still substantial enough they could go out and measure those, um, but they did not do as detailed of terrestrial laser scan data on those sites. And we're gonna use both of these in our analysis. So looking at the terrestrial laser scan data, this is the Redcliffe Southwest site. And so there are several epochs of data. Some of those had major earthquakes that happened in between them. Others were kind of following the sequence after the, the first big earthquake happened the February 22nd, 2011. So this image shows some example change detection results uh, from this, this particular site, Redcliffe Southwest, uh, through time. And we can drill in and zoom in. And on the right, we can kind of see a detail of uh, some of the geomorphic processes happening on this particular section of slope. And so in this particular one on the right, um, the color is based off of the change since the February 22nd, 2011, compared to the left one, which is just a change between epochs. On the right, though, the change between epochs is highlighted with the black lines that you see. And uh, what we see is that when you have this, this rock fall happening from the earthquake, the areas around the stuff that fell off in the earthquake tends to be destabilized. And you tend to see kind of this growth pattern um, in terms of the, the rock fall activity with time. So we can take that terrestrial laser scan data and uh, more efficiently process it and create individual rock fall clusters by applying a kinetic components of and then from this, we can identify volumes of these individual clusters of rockfall that happen. And so all these different colors represent different connected sections of rockfall that fell down between these, these two different epochs in time. And once we do this type of analysis from the data, we can then plot magnitude frequency relationships, which give us an idea of the hazard in the area. So magnitude frequency curve, as you see on the left, is where we bin the data based off of volume, and then we count how many um, rockfall events fall within each volume bin. And in this case, we normalize those frequencies to the number per meter squared per day. Um, so this is for the Peacock Scallop site and the different um, surveys that were completed after the earthquakes and, and, and with the different cycles going on. And so um, what we can see is, is what happens to these magnitude frequency curves with time after the earthquake. And so that's what the image on the right shows is that scaling coefficient, which tells you how far to the right um, the magnitude frequency relationship is going to plot. And we can see that that scaling relationship decreases with time after the earthquake, uh, very beautifully following a power law relationship with an R squared of 0.92. So ROARS stands for the Rockfall Activity Rate System, and it provides an indication or forecast of the magnitude of rock that could fall from a slope based off of height, angle, and area, so some basic geometric properties and based on a given level of earthquake shaking. It also uh, computes the increase in, in non-earthquake rockfall rates following a major earthquake. And so these aren't ones that were not directly triggered from an earthquake, but um, were a result of the fracturing that happened in the cliff, leading to an increased amount of rockfall activity during the subsequent rainstorms and other events that happen. And then lastly, um, ROARS provides you with an estimate of the time that it takes after a major earthquake for the post-earthquake rockfall rates to decrease back to pre-earthquake rates. So there are a couple assumptions that go into this. One, that um, the volume of debris is going to be a function of the magnitude of shaking, or PGA is uh, what we're using for that, or the, and the geometry of the slope. Uh, so the slope, area, height, and so on. And then also the other assumption is, uh, based off our observations of the Canterbury New Zealand earthquake data, is that we see this kind of fracturing happening as a result of the earthquake that damages the slope. And um, basically that causes the non-earthquake rockfall rates to temporarily increase and then eventually decay off with time um, as those, those portions that were destabilized have fallen off um, and eventually kind of reach that equilibrium again. So the earthquake comes and it shakes up the slope a lot, it knocks down all the really loose stuff that's precariously overhanging, um, but then it also is fracturing different components that aren't gonna immediately fell, but will fell um, are more susceptible to failure in future rainfall or thermal expansion events. And so this is the observed data from Christchurch for our different sites. You know, again, red dots represent different earthquake events and the volume of those particular slopes that came down. These volumes, again, are normalized by a meter squared per day. And then the blue dots represent the non-earthquake ones. Um, so these are TLS uh, terrestrial laser scan surveys that were done um, without an earthquake in, in that particular epoch of data that we we're looking at. The blue lines um, represent the geomorphic rates that were computed by a previous study with GNS Science looking at debris piles and talus deposits below the slope. And blue is their mean estimate and the dotted dashed line is their upper estimate associated with that. 
So we can take this information and then we can develop a model from it. And so this is uh, the model that's based off of the slope height, slope gradient and peak ground acceleration. And um, through multivariate regression with those parameters in the Canterbury data set, we are able to come up with this equation. And so in the bottom left shows the observed versus the forecasted volume. And we see again, there, there's very good agreement between the two, R squared of 0.62. The ones shown, the dots shown in red are the really big sites with the terrestrial laser scan data. And then the blue are, are large sites that weren't terrestrial laser scanned, but that GNS went in and made field measurements of the rockfall um, that happened there. So there are sites with less rockfall volume compared to the, the major sites that we discussed previously. And then on the right is just kind of an example um, based off of peak ground acceleration on the x-axis and then different slope angles, um, what the rock ball volume predicted by the model looks like. And so this is for a slope height of, of 90 meters, and then we could generate a set of curves um, for different slope heights. So they're looking kind of more detail at these contributing factors and, and why they were selected for the model. Um, so looking at kind of a few of these, these plots in the bottom left, we've got peak ground acceleration on the x-axis and the rock ball volume on the y. And uh, what we see here is we don't really see this, this very clear trend for the blue dots, uh, which are those, those large slopes um, that with the field measurements, it's kind of just a big blob and scatter. Um, we do see a little bit with the major sites, um, but again, we don't see this, this really thing that just jumps out that you would expect of um, rock ball volume being directly correlated with the peak ground acceleration. And uh, the hypothesis for this that we have is that basically because the ground shaking um, needs to exceed a triggering threshold. Um, once it's exceeded that triggering threshold, everything that's kind of ready to fall is going to fall. And then the fracturing that happens in the slope um, needs more weathering and time before that, that stuff starts falling down. So the, the peak ground acceleration is going to be dictate how much fracturing happens and is, is going to affect that time delay. Um, but it's not going to, you know, in, in some of this, we don't really see this, this massive correlation with it. Um, in terms of, of what's fallen down, we see more of it related to the slope geometry parameters like uh, slope height and slope angle um, associated with that. So we have that data from New Zealand from different events. How do we use this in a forecasting sense? Well, we can use technologies like mobile and airborne LIDAR uh, to capture the slope height and scan along a segment of the, the cliff and get a really good distribution of, of what that height looks like or the slope gradient. Uh, for peak ground acceleration, we have USGS shake maps and Alaska Earthquake Center and other agencies that produce scenario earthquake events. Next thing we need is we need to know what the pre-earthquake rockfall rates look like. And so for our sites in Oregon and Alaska, we did repeat laser scans of these sites with terrestrial laser scanning. And then we normalize those by area and time. And so what you're seeing here are the five different Oregon sites um, based off the volume. We know the time between surveys. Uh, we can measure what the slope area looks like, and then we apply a bulking factor to account for the fact that after the rocks fall off the cliff, um, they're going to deposit in a looser state than what they were when they were intact in the cliff. And from that, we can compute our baseline rates. Now, obviously, the longer time period you average these over, the better estimate you'll have of what those look like. To improve the efficiency of the calculations, and I uh, recently gave a webinar talking more about kind of the behind the scenes processing, uh, but this is just a streamlined software package that allows us to really quickly extract these geometric measurements from LiDAR data, perform the change detection, and um, perform these, these types of analyses. So step three, uh, what we need to do is we need to figure out what that day one non-earthquake increase. And so, you know, we've computed that increase in volume as a result of the earthquake itself. Um, but we need to look at how much is, is going to be that typical day-to-day -day increase. And so again, we use the Canterbury earthquake sequence uh, data collected by GNS Science. And we look at those factor of increases are um, earthquake ones, just looking at the non-earthquake epochs. And um, again, we do this for the mean estimate and the upper estimates from the geomorphic rates that we have. And then the fourth step is we can factor the decay with time and we can look at that and see what those trends look like. So again, we do this for the mean and the upper rates and we can look at the number of days since February 22nd, 2000 earthquake and we see these power law distributions associated with each one of those. So let's kind of jump in and look at more how this is applied within Oregon. 
And so we have five sites within the state of Oregon that we looked at. One is Pioneer Mountain, Eddyville, on a recently reconstructed area of highway on Highway 20. And this cuts through what's called the Taiyi Formation that is basically sandstone um, layers with siltstone interbedded that create these very slippery surfaces that siltstone erodes very quickly. And so it leaves this cantilevered sandstone that fells very, very quickly and has a lot of rockfall. Uh, Rowena is basalt along the Columbia River Gorge on Interstate I-84. Um, this particular site has created a lot of problems for the Department of Transportation, has shut down the freeway on occasions, and, and even led to months where uh, there was reduced capacity for uh, fixing the rock slope and cleaning up the debris. Hog Rock is on US-20, going up through the Cascades on a very precarious curve, and so one of the big challenges is as rocks fall down from this particular slope, um, there's very little warning for motorists as they round the curve, um, especially as they're either going down the, the hill or up the hill. Um, so it's a, already kind of a challenging road to, to drive and a big safety hazard. And then Canyon Mountain is, is close to Interstate 5, uh, not necessarily as active as the other sites, but just given the volume of traffic on Interstate 5 causes a lot of concerns. And then finally Yellow Jacket, which is one of our most active sites, um, but on all, one of the least active roads. Uh, but this site has frequently had very large chunks of rock fall down, um, roll across the road and into the, the creek nearby. So for um, our peak ground acceleration estimates, we use a platform called OHELP that was developed with um, support for the Cascadia Lifelines program. And um, OHELP stands for the Oregon Hazards Explorer for Lifeline program. And it contains mapping that was done for the Oregon Resilience Plan to basically estimate what sort of shaking levels we would expect across the state. And so it's an interactive platform. We can extract these, these values for that we need. And used mobile scanning and terrestrial laser scanning to go and scan these cliffs with time and get our baseline rates. So we could do our change detection, get our failure clusters, um, as you see in the top where we have our individual rockfall activity on there. We can zoom in and look in a little more detail at kind of where these different rocks have fallen on be between these, these epochs uh, with the richness of the terrestrial laser scan data. And again, we can develop magnitude frequency curves to help us understand what's going on at each one of these different sites and what the relative hazard level is between the, the different sites. So you can see here, um, yellow jacket is the one that's the most active bound by the fact that the magnitude frequency curves shifts up to the upper right. Um, we produced a computation spreadsheet for Oregon DOT so that they could quickly do these computations and apply the ROARS model. So we'll zoom in and take a look at the baseline computation. So this is where we would bring in the information from our terrestrial laser scan data. So the length, the average slope angle, the height, the area, and then the volume from the change, as well as the time between the surveys. And we apply our bulking factor and boom, we've got our baseline rates for each of the sites. And so the top is, is each of the sites evaluated for magnitude nine Cascadia subduction zone event. And then using that same event, we looked in more detail at kind of some of the sub slopes within the Eddyville corridor. Next, we have our um, outputs. Um, after we put in our peak ground acceleration, we can then compute our day one earthquake rate and the increase factor from the earthquake as well as the non-earthquake. And one thing to just kind of point out here is that we can use this model to um, estimate what that, that value is, but also an uncertainty range because we have the mean and upper and we also have lower um, estimates associated with those. So for example, for Canyon Mountain, we can see that it, it, we would expect um, non-earthquake rockfall to increase by 134 times of what it is on day one. Um, and then we've got kind of our uncertainty bounds. We can then estimate what the magnitude of volume that's going to be, so 12 cubic meters, and normalize that by length to kind of uh, be a useful parameter for the DOTs, for their maintenance personnel, to kind of get an estimate of, of what they're expecting. And then how long is this going to last? Well, we can use our restoration time equation to, to figure this out. So that site we estimated would be about a year and a half um, with a range of 1.1 to 2.04 years um, associated with it. So we kind of give those, those uncertainty bounds. But this, this gives information that helps them prioritize between the sites, determine what level of um, increased maintenance they're gonna need, trucks are gonna need, people are gonna need, and so on to remove all this debris that's gonna happen. Um, Milos, Hog Rock, and Rowena, um, we don't see these increases, and that's because the PGA values uh, there were below one meter um, per second squared. And as a result of that, the staking wasn't strong enough to trigger, earth, um, trigger a lot of rockfall activity there. 
And so we wouldn't expect that to happen. It's located more um, towards the east away from the, the main strong shaking. You know, still still some moderate shaking going on there, but not enough to, to really trigger this, this process. Okay, let's uh, go now up to Alaska. And so this is work by Kat Holton for a master's thesis here at Oregon State University. And with this, she looked at a lot of different um, earthquake scenario events and how those would affect rockfall activity on two corridors in the state. And so um, she looked at a lot of different scenarios. I'm just going to show you kind of a couple examples as an illustration here. And so this is in Glitter Gulch, which is on the Parks Highway and um, shows different events like the Western Denali Fault, the Northern Foothills or the Western Boundary Zone um, earthquake event. And from these, um, the larger the circle means the larger volume expected um, at that particular site as a result from the earthquake. And then the color, the, the lighter the color means the, um, or sorry, the, the lighter the color means the shorter the duration to reach a restoration state, the darker the color means the longer time it will take to reach its restoration state in days. And so really quickly, we have these visuals that transportation personnel can kind of use to identify here's the areas we need to focus on based off of these different scenario earthquake events um, and kind of see how those, those behave. The plots at the bottom show the volumes based off of the mile post, and they may look uh, fairly similar across these different scenarios. Um, and part of that's because of the, the source material um, in, in these different areas um, really controls how much rockfall volume you're going to see more so than the, the PGA. Um, but um, you also keep in mind that it is a log scale, and so uh, you don't quite see those, those differences as much. But let's go jump down to Long Lake along the Glen Highway Corridor. And so here we've got a couple different events, including the recent Anchorage, Alaska earthquake that happened in 2018. And from this, we can look at this site and see kind of the effects of where the rock falls happen. Um, the rock falls are, tend to not be as many big rockfall slopes here as, as there is in the Glitter Gulch corridor. Um, so they're all kind of more moderate size rock slopes um, with the exception of just a few. And you can see that the distribution of rockfall activity looks very different depending on the scenario earthquake event. And so they can plan where they stage things, where they apply mitigation efforts in order to um, keep the highway open and keep it safe after earthquake events. So just some quick observations from the data is we do see this clear time dependent trends and increase in rockfall activity that's quantified related to PGA and time since earthquake. The ROARS methodology is a new forecasting model that takes just basic slope geometry inputs and PA, and we can estimate how much rock fall is going to increase. Um, the source material or the size of the cliff, the geometry is a really significant factor in um, how this is, this is all going to be affected and where we're going to see those, those increases in rock fall activity. And then it gives us the ability to look at different scenario earthquakes and plan and prioritize our corridors accordingly. So with that, I want to acknowledge the many partners that funded this research and provided data for this effort, as well as the many collaborators who participated with me in this research and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you, right. Mike. Thank you. So um, there, there were uh, a, a, it was sort of a lively uh, Q&A in the chat, but uh, at this point, I. Uh, it, Welcome anybody who would like to ask any questions, either by raising their hands or uh, entering the questions in the meeting room chat. Mike, did you did you want to add anything to any of the replies that that you had? Yeah, I think I, <laughs> I think we got through most of them in there. It was a, quite a marathon typing it all up, but. Yeah, there are a lot of the questions on some of the different factors and some of the challenges um, associated with the data. You know, one of the one of the exciting things about this data set that GNS Science collected in New Zealand with the terrestrial laser scan data is it's a very rich data set encompassing what's happening over multiple events. The challenge with that, though, is then teasing out the individual comp contributions of um, each of those ind individual events and kind of separating them. Um, so we were hoping to take advantage of the Alaska earthquake in 2018 to kind of collect some data with that because we did have some really detailed terrestrial laser scan data at some sites before. And we're in the process of analyzing some scans that we've done after that to kind of see if we see the same trends there. But unfortunately, those, those data are a little bit further outside the main shaking area. And so it's not as clear of a, a trend, but we did see um, some interesting results in, in that when we're looking at that data set. Right. And, and presumably for larger events and, and larger uh, ground failures, you don't need quite the, the, the accuracy that, that you had for the, the cliffs that you showed. Yeah, right? 
yeah, there's there's quite a bit that could be done with um, terrestrial laser scan data, or sorry, airborne laser scan data, and kind of the coarser data set. You know, one of the big challenges on this particular data set um, with the airborne data is, is the cliffs are very steep, and so the data before was very spotty. Um, they basically had an airborne lidar data set from 2003, was was kind of the pre data set, and there really wasn't a lot of information on the cliff. So sometimes you're kind of over interpolating, and it's really hard to get a good bound on those data sets. Um, whereas right. terrestrial at least gives you that that more detailed view of the cliff, so you can see what's going on. But it was it was definitely you know with a um, an older terrestrial laser scan system, so we were kind of about 10 centimeter resolution on the cliff. So of course by today's standards, <laughs> but still good. All right, great, thanks. Well, uh, so with that, I I think uh, we'll we'll thank Mike once again, and and uh, Margaret, are you ready to introduce the next speaker? Sure. Yes. Thank you, Mike. That was a great presentation. Uh, next, we have Eileen Martin, and she is an assistant professor at Virginia Tech. I also noticed on the webpage, uh, Colorado School of Mines as well listed. Uh, and her presentation is entitled Compressing the Computing Requirements of Fiber Optic Seismic Monitoring. So take it away, Eileen. Hi, I'm Eileen Martin. I'm going to talk about compressing the computing requirements of fiber optic seismic monitoring. This is work that's with my students, Joseph Kump, Samantha Paulus, Brandon Pearl, Tony Artis, and Sarah Morgan, all at Virginia Tech. If you're not familiar with fiber optic seismic monitoring or distributed acoustic sensing, this is the technology that repurposes a fiber optic cable as a series of strain or strain rate sensors that are very densely spaced. That means that we get really detailed seismic data. What you see in the background here is actually a series of recordings of data that were collected in um, the Penn State for Sea Array, which is led by my colleague Tiwan Zhu. And um, you can see some cars driving by, a lot of little details in there that we have to be able to work through. So overall, the problem that we're working with is that regardless of whether we're analyzing data locally on our laptops, on some kind of computing cluster, or on a cloud system, large scale fiber optic seismic data is just much, much bigger than the seismic data that we've collected historically. And across the, across the spectrum of scientific computing, data movement is becoming a really big bottleneck for a lot of problems. And especially for those of us who work in passive seismic methods, those are really data intensive relative to the amount of computation going on. And so for us, data movement is a primary bottleneck. I'll show you that we can get some partial solution by working with some data products or lossy compressed data um, as part of our overall workflows. And um, we can actually get even further improvements if we integrate those data products and compressed formats directly into our passive seismic analysis algorithms. If you're not already on the fiber optic sensing bandwagon, why do we, why do we care about it? Well, fiber optic sensing is letting us have really dense sensor spacing over long distances, we're able to fit these sensors, which are really flexible, into a variety of new locations, especially urban areas, down boreholes, um, across glaciers sometimes. And these sensors are pretty useful across a wide range of frequencies. It's a really broadband response. We're able to leave these sensors out for long periods of time without having to worry about differences uh, in our time lapse studies, so we can get longer durations. We also don't need a lot of labor to swap out power sources or replace broken sensors. So this is really exciting for people like me coming from the more computational and data analysis side where, uh, let's face it, I'm a little bit lazy. So this is great for, for scientists like me. Typically, the data rates and quantities that we're working with are in the millions of points per second easily. And these data quantities may not feel so familiar if it's in points per second. So let's just grab like nine of these experiments of varying low to high rates and look at our cumulative data quantities. And we see that over like a five year period, um, just that small collection of experiments totaled up to about 800 terabytes of data. And that wasn't even just choosing the high sample rate experiments. This was a mix of low and high rates to give us a feel for what our, our data archives might look like in the future. To give you a, a sense of how big 800 terabytes is, that's about the same size as all of the IRIS data management center archives, depending on how you count various parts of it. Dense and continuous seismic data is easier to collect than ever before, whether it's cell phone accelerometers, wireless nodes, low cost nodes, or just 
known arrays in general, or DAS. Um, we're seeing that we're getting a lot higher data quantities than we have in the past. And the amount of labor it takes to collect these data are getting lower and lower. So that means that our data needs to go more and more towards, or our labor needs to go more and more towards uh, analyzing that data effectively. But often what happens in practice is that we collect a bunch of data and we just get a lot of like hard drives sitting around or maybe local archive storage or you know maybe sitting on some, some research group cluster. Uh, this means that right now we have this issue of kind of limited access. There's a limit on scientific reproducibility when we don't have open data that everyone has access to. And with a lot of data, this means that our analysis is having to spend a ton of time and a ton of electricity, and thus also a lot of money, on just waiting for data I.O. to happen. That is to say, input and output of data. So the solutions that my group has been focusing on are things like reducing data quantities through compression or through um, data product calculations, and also algorithmic advances that really take advantage of those uh, compressed or data product values that we calculate. But there are also other solutions going on uh, as far as pushing for larger public archives for seismic data, including some moves to, to include cloud providers as one, one source of hardware to support more open data access. When we're thinking about this, we need to think about data movement as the thing that matters, the thing that we really want to reduce. So these are all different places where we have some opportunity to reduce our electricity usage, our time waiting, all of that stuff. And as a general trend across computational science, we're seeing that arithmetic operations like a floating point operation, um, those are getting increasingly faster relative to all the measures of data movement that matter, things like network latency, memory latency, network bandwidth and memory bandwidth, all of these things are getting slower and slower relative to how fast we can actually do things like addition and multiplication. So when we're thinking about our algorithms, we care a lot more about reducing data movement or memory operations, more so than just reducing our number of adds and multiplications. All right, so let's take a look at a partial solution. We might think about calculation and storage of data products or lossy compression to reduce the data movement in our workflows. So typically what people do if they're going to use compressed data or data products is uh, maybe they have some large scale data to start with and you're going to do some compression using sort of medium speed access memory and your compute to basically compress that data, then maybe you store that data in smaller files on very slow to access storage, maybe that's uh, sitting in the file system on your computer or on your hard drive, maybe it's sitting in archive storage on your computer cluster or slow to access storage on your cloud. Once you're actually ready to analyze the data, then you're going to actually do all the decompression of your large scale reconstructed data and then do your full analysis on this large scale reconstructed data that's approximately the same as your original large scale data. Okay, so that, that's kind of the typical workflow for using compressed data. When you're in the field, the time it takes to get any sort of data from the field to your office, high performance computing center or data archive, that's going to be your really slow time. So you want to make sure that if you only have, say, limited bandwidth to get information back to the office, that you really have the most information packed into every byte of what's coming off of your field computer. But even within your field computer, you also want to optimize how you use your various levels of memory hierarchy in your algorithms so that you reduce that data movement as much as possible. It can make a big difference in how much computing you can do in real time at the edge. Many of us deal with high performance computing clusters and there we need to worry about our data transfer between various types of storage, whether it's slow to access archival storage, a little faster to access memory like maybe storage for our research groups that's a little faster, or if we have some kind of local or scratch or workspace, and how we do those data transfers, it all gets faster if we can work with compressed data or data products instead of the original raw data. We can also look at these structures on cloud systems, like for instance, on AWS, we might have a workflow that has these various types of uh, say S3 buckets at different tiers and elastic block storage is a little faster to access from our compute instances. So 
I know Maureen Dinola is going to go into more detail on these cloud systems, so I hope you stick around for her talk. So just thinking about like a case study of how we're, we're using compression in practice, let's think about like we have one experiment on analysis of industrial vibration data. So we start off with our fiber optic data that was recorded on more than 3,000 sensors. It was originally saved in the space and time domain. And um, so we have all of these files. And the way that we deal with this is we save them all by doing a discrete wavelet transform and then some thresholding. So we get somewhere between five times and 20 times compression. Then we do things like change point detection on our wavelet compressed data, or we might do things like cross correlation analysis of that wavelet compressed data to look for where we have some kind of similarities between different sensors or from one time to another time for similar events. And in fact, we've been able to uh, predict theoretical error bounds that actually bound our, our true errors pretty well for this. And um, that's just based on knowing what our compression type is. We're also thinking about this in another study, more going from the field to where we're actually doing our analysis. So coming up in August, uh, actually the week of uh, this Sage Gauge workshop, I'm going to be up in northern Alaska um, doing a permafrost study where we've got a DAS interrogator that's going to be up there saving our original quality data. It's also calculating and saving data products that um, Brandon Pearl and Samantha Paulus have been coding up. And um, we're also going to be doing remote quality checks um, so that throughout the next year or two, we'll be able to basically have different levels of access so we can remotely check on these smaller data products or compressed data. And every once in a while, we get our hard drives mailed to us with our actual raw data because um, we don't have great internet access up there. So it's just another place where being able to have those data products or compressed data can really help us start to be productive in between the times when we're getting those physical transports of our hard drives. It also allows us to be more efficient about working with those, those um, raw data once we get them because we already have some indicator of data quality on all parts of the data without even having to read it all in yet. But we can do more than just compress data into files and then read those files and decompress them. So that was the old way of dealing with things. But what we can actually do instead is we're actually starting to do um, analysis of our lossy compressed data in their compressed domains. So this can actually let us um, work just with fast access memory and compute um, instead of having to reconstruct these other large scale data that are going to be pretty expensive still for us to wait on. So let's take a look at how we can actually integrate our data products or our compressed data formats directly into our passive se seismic analysis algorithms, because this can help us get further improvements in our sort of end to end passive analysis pipelines. Um, especially for things like interferometry based analyses. I'm going to focus on ambient noise imaging here. And the reason for that is that typically if we have n sensors in an array, or if we have like a really dense array and is very big, that means that our, our typical analysis is going to scale like n squared. And in particular, I don't care so much that my number of floating point operations scales as n squared, but I do care a lot that my number of data operations or, or memory movements scales as n squared. So I have to go through all my different pairs of sensors when I'm doing ambient noise interferometry to do these cross correlations. So when we're looking at the map to how we do more efficient ambient noise an analysis, it actually matters if we really care about getting those cross correlation functions or noise correlation functions, or if we're actually trying to go for something else. So if we're trying to go for something else like maybe surface wave dispersion analysis or body wave velocity analysis without actually having to look at those body waves themselves, but rather just looking at whether we have certain body wave velocities showing up, we can actually do faster methods that just scale linearly with our number of sensors. And that allows us to actually skip our cross correlation. So that's some older work from my dissertation. But aside from just refactoring what our algorithms are, again, we can do our cross correlation analysis in various compressed domains. So for instance, if we have a low rank representation of our data matrix that's represented by sensors versus time, then what we can do is actually take our cross correlation for each one of our sensor pairs and all of our different time lags that we care about. We can break out just a piece that's just time lag dependent in the middle. And that's common across all of our sensor pairs. So suddenly 
We get a tall skinny matrix times a little bitty matrix times a short fat matrix. It's something that's much, much more scalable than what we had before. And in fact, separates out the scalability of high frequency data in time from high density data in space. And so our scalability suddenly can be separated there. If we've done basically thresholded wavelet representations of our data, then our data here in F, we can represent that with uh, the sparse wavelet representation of our data, which might be how we've, we've compressed our data to store. And then we can actually split out our data into a set of sparse wavelet coefficients from one sensor times a pretty sparse tensor times another sparse vector of wavelet coefficients from the other sensor. And our theoretical analysis of this has actually led us to improve data structures based on what our cross correlations of wavelet basis functions are that are common to all sensors, regardless of what the data is like. It allows us to have redundancy across time lags, various toplet structures, and deal with symmetry and redundancy of subblocks. So that's all just from our, our mathematical theory. So we can get those approximate cross correlations that are still pretty good representations of our, our cross correlations of our original data, which was just random ambient noise anyways. So just to recap, whether we're working with our data locally or at the edge on high performance computing clusters or on cloud systems, it's a primary bottleneck that our large scale fiber optic seismic data is just much bigger than the seismic data we've worked with before. And we're really held back by our large scale data movement. If we work with data products or lossy compressed data, and we have those available that can really help us reduce our data movement in our workflows and especially we can get even more savings if we're able to actually integrate those data products or those compressed data formats directly into how we're analyzing our data especially for passive seismic algorithms that are sort of interferometry based for the last part of this talk let's take a look at some of our community needs dealing with large-scale das data i think that uh, this issue of being able to archive many terabyte data in the long term is a really big one. Um, also, we need to have more availability of large scale or high performance computing training for seismologists as we're starting to have more and more large scale data. Additionally, we need to have wider availability of open DAS data. This is for reproducibility, but also for training the next generation of seismologists. And I'd also like to bring up that there's a real opportunity here that may be able to help us with attracting and retaining scientists with diverse backgrounds. Uh, just to give you a feel for, for what the current status is of um, sharing this larger seismic data, Department of Energy's Geothermal Data Repository migrated this past year to using Amazon Web Services support. A lot of us are just putting data up on Google Drive or GitHub or mailing hard drives. Um, some of us are able to use university data archives at universities that have those kinds of resources. I know that IRS and UNAVCO are working to expand their services as well in the coming years. Here's a list of some of the existing open DAS data. If you're interested in, in getting access to that and in being able to use data that will give you reproducible scientific results. So on this issue of large scale computing training, I think one of the biggest challenges we have is that right now, um, computational science and engineering doesn't really have a home at many universities. Um, there are some universities that have that, but it's, it's relatively limited. Um, we also have a relatively limited pool of geoscience faculty that have those particular skills. And so being able to train our existing faculty and also make sure that we kind of emphasize that in training the next generation of faculty and um, is, is going to be really big. So I think one of the biggest solutions that um, IRIS and others can do to support is, is really training workshops that are coordinated by geoscience and HPC efforts. We can look at things like the CHEESE initiative in Europe or the Computational Infrastructure for Geodynamics uh, initiative that's part of the DOE National Labs as, as models of how to do this and even places where we can currently be sending our students to, to try and learn I think there's also a lot of potential for being able to attract and retain diverse geoscientists. So like I mentioned earlier, um, some of us just are not big on field work. And so um, for those of us who just aren't big on that, then DAS is a great way to be able to um, do field work and really own an experiment without having to you know, to spend tons of time out in the field. But also for some people for whom it's not just a preference, but really they may have accessibility issues to doing field work. This can be an important step in making sure that people can have 
um, a real ownership of an experiment. The initial installation has relatively low barriers compared to traditional arrays. There's also little to no labor to maintain the array beyond the initial installation. And really the overwhelming role of what your time is spent on in these experiments with DAS is on data analysis, simply because we have so much data it becomes a huge task. We're often also performing fieldwork in populated areas, so there's a more clear relevance to everyone's lives. Um, and we also avoid some of the safety issues and lack of infrastructure that are encountered at remote sites um, that can be an accessibility issue for many communities. Additionally, the required data management and analysis skills are really in demand for employment across industries, government, and academia. And so this means that for any student who wants to see a clear connection between the training that they're getting in geosciences and the job opportunities that are available to them, that are good paying jobs, that are in demand, there's a really clear path there for them to have opportunities and a lot of flexibility. All right, well, thanks for your attention and I look forward to answering any questions you might have and discussing with you further. Thanks, Ali. Great talk. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and so you got some questions in the chat from uh, from me, and I, I see you just answered one from uh, Victor. Uh, so here's one from Michael. So I he says I thought you did a great job talking through some of the challenges at the end and potential solutions to build up that expertise. I guess that's just a comment, not a question. Thanks, Michael. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a lot of still open challenges, and like following up on Victor's question, he had asked about. Um, you know, if, if you really have to be specific to the variable of interest that you're trying to compress when you're designing these algorithms. And I think one of the mistakes that has, was made for a long time in the compression community was that people were looking at just how well is the raw data compressed in terms of maybe like an L2 norm or a Frobenius norm or something like that. And it was very much just what is the fidelity of this data on its own? And it wasn't seen in the context of applications. And so um, like I replied about, you know, your compression of, you know, is it a wave equation or heat equation like that matters. So for instance, things that are governed by the wave equation, you can have sort of an optimal sparsity result in the curvelet domain um, as one type of compression. And we see results from, for instance, like Jack Muir's recent work with Zhang Wenzhan, where they're, they're using that curvelet domain to really uh, sparsely represent DAS data, for instance. Um, but there's this other aspect of it, which is what do you want to do with it? Are you trying to detect events? Are you trying to um, perform full waveform inversion? And those are very different kinds of objectives. And so um, as we're kind of moving forwards, we're trying to actually go more towards what are these actual types of analysis that we're trying to do um, and trying to figure out how can we bound our errors of those output results that we really do care about. And so, for instance, when we're looking at doing our cross correlations in the wavelet domain, we're actually doing all of our error analysis so that it's propagating through the entire cross correlation process so that we can actually say something more about how well are we estimating the greens functions uh, with our noise correlations um, that are done with this compressed data. So hopefully that answers the question a bit better. Yeah, very, very complete. And, and, I, and I guess, you know, we, we can't anticipate all the, the uses of such data. So these, you know, our approaches might all the time. So, so some of the raw data has to be saved. Yeah, yeah. Or at least we need to make sure that when we're choosing a compression scheme, it's not overly specified to the set of just one type of analysis that we do. If we're finding that it's pretty good for a few different types of analyses, then maybe that's going to be good for a variety of other types in the future, or at least good enough. Yeah. Okay, um, any other questions before I leave? Well, I, I've noticed, so Eileen, don't go away because I've noticed that, that people tend to think of questions later and they come up in the chat. So uh, I hope you're available to respond. But, but with that, uh, thanks Eileen. And, and we'll, we'll move on to the next speaker. Margaret, are you ready? I am, yes. Thank you, Eileen. Another great talk. Um, and our final speaker today is Marine Denol. 
from an assistant, thank you, <laughs> an assistant professor at the University of Washington. And, and she also has the best shortest title of everybody, Cloud Seismology. So take it away, Maureen. Good morning, good afternoon. I'm Marine Denon, and I will present to you how we're scaling up our uh, big data workflows in seismology using cloud computing. This is a work done in collaborations with amazing grad students and undergrads and, and collaborators still on Mikasel. Um, typically, as seismologists, when we want to target large data set, we look at data availability. This is in July, the 16,000 seismic stations that are recording data that we can get a hold of. The Iris DMC, located in beautiful Seattle, gathers most of that seismic data. And as of early July, it had almost one petabyte of seismic data um, at the center. However, this does not account for the petascale uh, data that is already available for distributed acoustic sensing. So we know that the field is going toward uh, really large scale computing. Typical data workflow looks like this. We download data on our computer using uh, the internet we uh, detrain, demean, remove instrumental response by some filtering, extract feature, features, all of that is one piece of code that we apply to one, one file. Now, if we work with different stations or different snapshot, we're going to apply the same code over multiple files and ideally we'll have many computers to do that, that workflow. Now we can use uh, public resources such as HPC uh, computers to parallelize our flow. So this is the example of the Stampede 2 a computer hosted at TAC in Texas, which you can get a location from, uh, from Exceed. And you can just establish your parallel uh, download there and then just download the data product or even upload your, your stuff there. So what would be the utopia for seismologists? A giant petascale seismic archive close to a uh, HPC center. What this computer would look like is a petabyte file system with nicely organized files tightly connected to a compute cluster and high performance computing cluster. The cluster is a combination, a collection of small nodes that are all slightly, um, tightly connected with InfiniBand. And this will gain, um, you know, nice throughput speeds of above 50 gigabits per second. Now this is too expensive for NSF to support. And so the community has moved toward cloud computing. Cloud computing is both in terms of storage and of compute. On the storage end, you see on the left a petabyte object store, which um, I'm using the cartoon and jargon of, of Amazon AWS, where each of these uh, square here is representing a file or an object. All of them are, are, um, are gathered in a S3 bucket, and each of these can be uh, queried with an HTTP request. The cloud computing part is the same nodes that you would have on an HPC cluster, except that they are not tightly connected. There are slow, slower uh, communication between the nodes. That said, for throughput speeds, this is great. Lots of small computers, all can query the object store, and we can gain up to 50 gigabytes per or more uh, throughput speed as we wish. Um, so how do we move data to the cloud? Well, we can use internet, um, downloading data from Iris to the cloud. McCarthy et al. had a great paper in SRL that discussed the scalability of, of this workflow. They've uh, tested different data volumes and calculated the download time for these on, on AWS. I uh, found that the main limitation is the internet speed. In their exercise, they managed to download and, and do minimal processing of six terabytes of data for um, just 80 hours of compute time and spend $100. What we've, uh, we brought a different workflow, not in Python this time, but in Julia, and Julian Schmidt uh, was leading this effort, undergraduate student, excellent, who managed to download um, from the IRIS archive and from the NCEDC archive 63 terabytes of data in 72 hours. Um, and we, we use a different rate, um, only spent $50 for this. And so this is a combination of the difference in computing language and some of the data workflows, but Nonetheless, this is uh, Julia is, is great performance for that. And we've dumped all of our data on an S3. We found during this exercise that you, uh, if you want to crank a lot of data, you want to store your data on S3 for the later compute. But downloading is more efficient with many small instances. Um, we can stream then data from your, the S3 buckets to your compute. There, the throughput speed is, is of course enhanced because you have this object store next to you. 
On a single instance, we managed to get in the US West 2 region, two gigs per second of, of throughput speeds with parallel download. Object stores are fantastic for scaling in, in requests. They can get really hammered with requests. Um, an S3 object can get up to 5,000 requests per second on the single file or object. Um, in my interpretation of the McCarthy paper, the Iris DMC can handle 250 requests per second or so. Um, once we do this parallel download, we can um, you know, compute and then dump our archive our data products on the archive again. Uh, there's already data available on S3. The SCADC uh, bucket has over 100 terabytes of continuous and even data. The temporary array of Porotomo has DAS and Donald array, again, a large data set that can be already um, queried and hammered for, for compute and fun science. Now, for processing data on the cloud, I mentioned that we do a lot of low memory jobs. And so what we want to do is um, have this customized hardware where we have memory management and storage management on each of these instances, but we want to be able to launch hundreds of them at once, which you can with this elastic computing uh, platform, from at least from AWS. And what we can do is um, query data from several buckets, still with amazing uh, throughput speeds, do all your computing on these instances, and then dump your, uh, your products on, on, your, on your own uh, S3 bucket, for instance. And um, this nice um, heterogeneous computing facility allows us to test things like, you know, cost and time. It's always the trade-off. So Tim, uh, graduate students, uh, just finished his PhD, developed a nice ambient noise code in Julia, and tested the um, autocorrelation of 8,000 channels of a DAS array, um, recording at 1,000 hertz. And for one day of data, he managed to compute uh, all of these correlations in one day on the CPU um, in a single instance, but only four hours on the GPU. And this is the kind of flexibility in the hardware that if you have a bit of money and no time, you spend this GPU, but if you have uh, no money and time, you just go for the CPU. Uh, I'll show you a few research examples. The first project I will discuss with you today is the, um, the building of a library of MBNOS cross correlation functions, which we do in collaboration with uh, Greg Barrows at Stanford and his former postdoc, Liz and, and Aurelien. And we call this project the C4, Comprehensive California Cross Correlations, which we're trying to do is pairing every of these, um, every station pair and that you see on this map to create um, virtual um, earthquakes and, and understand surface wave propagation between them. So we're looking at over 700 stations from 1999 until 2021. Um, each month of our, our period is a month of data is a good uh, uh, time period to work with a single instance. So on one month of data for a in single instance, we can gather 30,000 raw waveforms. We've created 60 billion smart cross correlations, which is impractical. So we um, stacked and downsized to 500,000 uh, cross correlations uh, for past processing. We've run these jobs for each of these months on an R5 instance, and we've tagged on a uh, local storage. It can be an SSD or an HDD. Uh, we've tagged on five terabytes to handle these, to balance the memory and, and storage flow. Um, and we, uh, with the codes that we've been using developed by Julian and, and Tim, uh, it runs over five hours for one month of data. So we estimate about $10 per, per month. Of course, it changes with the availability of, of stations. So I'll show you a, a quick example of, of a one month stack. Uh, this is for the one hertz uh, cross correlation. We're looking at almost statewide, but mostly SCS and data. Um, and what we find is uh, for the qu quite low frequency uh, cross correlation, they're two sided. Uh, you can see a move out, although quite dispersive, but a group move out of 2.5 kilo kilometer per second, which is a nice average of surface wave speed in, in California. Um, lesson learned from this experiment, um, downloading the data only costs $50, as I mentioned, storing it costs that amount per day. And we had um, downloaded the entire thing and started doing some uh, benchmarking exercise and debugging, and I ended up being a ton of money on storage when really I just had to like work with a one month chunk. So lesson learned, like try to avoid uh, storing things in the long run on, on S3. 
Uh, the second example of research we've been doing on the cloud um, is led by Tim Clements. It's uh, one of the core of his PhD. Um, using the same data that we collected, the 63 terabytes plus the um, 50 about uh, terabytes of the uh, SCEDC. What Tim has been doing is working on a single station correlation, in which case we're doing this cross correlation, but just at one, one, uh, one station, extremely embarrassed in parallel at this point. And for the time unit here, we're working with a day worth of data. We're going to collect about a thousand raw waveforms. We create these uh, cross channels, also cross correlations, but single station. And um, he's, um, he's been working with a slightly fancier instances, the M6 uh, G in that case, which is more expensive, um, but also faster. So over the course of this uh, 20 year plus uh, analysis, he's created something like 21 million autocorrelations or single station correlations. And for this unique instance, um, he uh, computed everything in 48 hours. And we only spent $120. Um, another common sense thing that we've learned is for some of these low key post processing, when you already have all your cross correlation and you're doing something that does not require uh, parallel processing, uh, you can just bring it back to your laptop and, and do this on. And so Tim um, loves working out of his laptop with a fancy processing, but only took four hours to do all of the post processing um, that may take for some other codes a lot more time. So I'll show you what we've um, we've um, achieved with this this project is we actually slowly realized that the, the time series of, of changes in velocity that we extract from these correlations is turning seismometers into strain meters. And effectively, what I'm showing here is uh, 15 years uh, worth of changes in seismic velocities um, that we track for each station, for each cross correlation, we can track the change in velocity. And each of these, you can see their seasonality associated with that, which actually we explain with the elastic um, undrained response due to precipitation. This is a Southern California example, specifically the Los Angeles area. And what you would notice is that over the course of 15, 20 plus years, there's an increase in the seismic velocities. And this is uh, largely due to the depletion in groundwater level, at least for the water table um, of that, experience, that California is experiencing. And we've, we've done a little bit of seismogeodesy in this other sense. And so here's an example where if you use nonlinear elasticity, you can actually show a proportionality between the seismic velocities and strains, um, volumetric strains, and that is all somewhat related to the water load. And so we've compared our DV time series flipped axis here uh, for negative up, changes in seismic velocities for a site um, next to Tahan Pass, and compared them directly with groundwater level and estimate from GRACE. We also looked at the GPS time series nearby, um, but we find great correspondence between um, seismic velocities and water levels, uh, thermal strains, and all that kind of thing. So that was um, kind of eye-opening thanks to this massive uh, cloud workflow. In a couple of days, you can actually come up with, uh, with strain meter data for 20 years worth of, of, um, of evolution. So now I want to touch a little bit on teaching on the cloud. Um, we I found that you know, with COVID and remote teaching, we found that it was necessary to move to cloud platforms through some of our tutorials. And I've, I've learned a lot by migrating my homework sets um, and computing with Python on Google Colab um, uh, notebooks. Uh, to the left, you can see that um, a quick finals that I gave to a graduate level course where we've um, basically were able to, I was able to upload some of my own seismic data on a Google Drive, which you can directly mount on the Google Cloud instance by, by doing some kind of syncing. So it allowed me to uh, upload my own data or metadata, and then the students would just mount my drive uh, to their local instance and run a lot of, of things and data crunching on, on the fly. They could also themselves dump some of their results on the Google Drive, which then I could take and analyze for, for grading. Um, so we, you know, there's some uh, very uh, fixed hardware and fixed software and environments on Google Cloud um, with Colab for Python. So we had to like think about about UpSpy and, and things like that. But um, it, it was extremely successful. And um, um, if if the Google e Education workspace remains or remain active, at least this is still a viable uh, way forward. 
The second thing I'm trying to evolve a little bit more into is, is using Binder um, to uh, construct both uh, controlled environments that we want. It's very specific for, you know, if I want to uh, teach in Julia or if I want to teach in other environments that the Google pl uh, Cloud um, does not uh, have automatically, you can just create your own containerized environment and uh, uh, use Binder to launch uh, your notebooks. So we created a GitHub repos for our own classes and then banderize some of the tutorials so then the students can directly launch um, the, the tutorials from there. Now, the, the hardware behind Binder, I think, is a little bit of distributed server between AWS and Google and maybe others. But I'm glad not to have to be aware of this and just, um, and just work with that. For bigger teaching requirements, such as machine learning um, uh, requirements, some of the TensorFlow modules are quite big. And so we want to make sure that um, we, might, we have to think when we set up our Jupyter Hub, like what's the allowed memory. Um, so there's, there's a little bit of thinking um, uh, to do in that sense, but it's so much easier than having students install the right version of Python. One of the challenges that scientific computing has with cloud infrastructure is the data format. The geospatial community is, I think, caught up with the challenges of uh, the object store type um, systems and develop the cloud optimized geotiff for, for imagery. Time series data is a little bit trickier. Uh, we, have, we want big files, but we want to read very small bits of it. And so NASA is, is spending a lot of time um, developing core tools to read H5 formats in, on the cloud. And J.P. Dwinsky is, um, is a, a software engineer at NASA who's rewrote the H5 library uh, to uh, optimally read um, uh, H5 files or bits of the H5 files on S3 um, through the ISAT2 um, projects. And this is work that we're doing with Bradley Pasky and incoming grad students at uni to basically um, use the ASDF H5 uh, container to um, read efficiently using a Flash core on, on S3. And I just wanted to note that JP Zwiski is amazing. He's, he's managed to speed up the read times by 130 um, manifolds to, um, to read data on S3 and on local. So it's not rewriting the format, it is rewriting the, the library that, that has been successful. So if you're like me, a little bit confused with Docker, EBS, EC2, all that jargon, of cloud computing, I still understand it. It's, it's still challenging. We really want to get to the science. And so what we're doing is working with uh, potentially amazing people. Uh, we can do who's graduating from Stanford with this nice end to end workflow on any cloud. I think it has two cloud providers um, possibilities where everything is containerized. Um, everything is nicely orchestrated with um, Kubernetes and the data streams in. He applies his machine learning modules like face picking and location. And outputs look um, and outputs a, a warning, or um, yeah, an, an, an alert. Um, so these are end-to-end -end workflows that were created on the cloud. Uh, if we don't want to see what's in the back end, we work with Dylan Mikesel, who was funded by ESIP to make a web-based uh, API for noise cross correlation analysis. So in which case, you don't see the back end of the orchestration of what Julia and environment you need. You just see the the browser um, browser page with a really going to be a fantastic user-friendly um, way. Uh, we also got almost funded um, a four-year project, Scopes, that is led by Cartape, where we are really exciting um, project to combine the benefits of the cloud for big data, the benefits of HPC for wave field modeling, and combine hybrid um, cyber infrastructure to please everybody. <laughs> and this will basically um, provide lots of training to students, um, benchmark softwares, and and, um, and containers uh, and everything we need to do large-scale seismic data processing. How do we pay for cloud? Credit cards. Um, it's not that expensive except storage, but if you want to rescale things up, you uh, submit a, a two-page document attached to your NSF proposal uh, using the cloud bank resource. I can provide examples, but the uh, cloud bank website has a lot of resources on how to run these correctly. It's, it's the same as an exceed allocation, except that you're turning your uh, compute time into dollar values based on the instance you want to use. Um, I have not addressed in this talk is IoT device and sort of streaming to the cloud. Um, there's a Mexican um, startup that is doing this for early warning. Many communities have adopted the cloud, the G5 
geoscience community, more like on climate science and environmental science, as you see, so Pangeo is doing a lot of that development. Um, and the SEDC um, is leading the way in terms of cloud computing for seismic data, and it's got a lot of cool tutorials for that as well. So I'll leave it up to here. Um, my conclusions are below with some tips, uh, but please contact me if you have any questions. All right, that's great. Thanks, Maureen. So you, you've got a, a number of questions in the chat and uh, you responded to them and uh, and we, we got sort of a challenge from, from Bex. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so let me just open it up to uh, responses, uh, questions from Maureen or, or uh, thoughts about what we do if we could uh, get infinite computing next to all the data. I can address uh... Rob's question about H5 Coral. Sure. This is something that's uh, uh, new out of NASA. And so the idea is you stream small bits of H5 files that are hosted on S3, and you only get a small bit of data on, on EC2. So you can have massive size H5 files, but you gain the speed and the efficiency at reading small, small data bits. And the idea is that if we have an efficient, finally, H5 format on the cloud, we can use the same. Um, readers on HPC uh, seamlessly. So it's really the, the bridge between object store and file systems. Okay, great. Other questions or comments? Yeah, so so Maureen, at, 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 towards the end of your talk, you 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 know you, you brought out the dollar signs and said it's not that expensive, but but I, I've, heard, I've heard to the great find that it, you know, if, if you do things wrong, it, it can be expensive. And so, you know, we don't want to burn through our research budgets by making mistakes I as we learn how to use this. So what, yeah. you know, what, how would you advise so, us to avoid that? Yeah, so it's not a machine that when you launch an instance, it's not a machine that's just going to keep running forever. You really have to terminate it and kill it twice to really kill it. Otherwise, the daughter uh, keeps going. That's why also we're trying to be more efficient at putting. This is kind of getting back to the old days of low memory, small computers, where we just want to have more efficient coding so we save time uh, and money. And um, I guess in my limited experience, it's really a trade-off. If you have money, you can use the fancy gear. If you don't, you can wait. Um, and the, the, I think the bottleneck for a large scale size margin is the storage. That's actually the most expensive. Um, so I spent three, four thousand dollars on data that was just sitting there for a few months, embarrassingly, when downloading it costs 50. Um, so uh, just be wary. They are, so it's hard to get into a cloud computing, I would say, today because uh, I use YouTube uh, to find all of the tutorials um, to learn uh, tricks here and there. There are resources that institutions have. They have champions of AWS or champions of Exceed, so you can talk to them and they can actually help you debug your code and set up your Kubernetes and everything. Um, but uh, what we're trying to do, and Eileen is, is going to be potentially doing some of that, is training the community uh, with the tutorials and showing them how to use the machines um, to be more efficient and to avoid wasting too much money. Great, thanks. Thanks for that advice. So, um, not I'm seeing other comments, but not other questions in the chat. So, unless someone wants to raise their hands, maybe we'll move on uh, to the next section. Yeah. So, Maureen, before you go, I wanted to thank you very much for yet another outstanding talk. We really uh, hit hit it out of the park with the speakers today. Thank